Hey everyone. In this mini lecture, I'm going to go over chapter 15, which is full of a lot of terminology that's going to be very important as we continue on in our study of the individual microbes. A lot of the things that you learn in chapter 15 will come back up again later on in unit five. So what I've done is created this document which has a lot of these terms on it and I want to go through and, and hit upon a few of these things. So a disease is any condition where the normal structure and function of the body is impaired. Diseases can be infectious or non-infectious. Some examples of some non-infectious diseases would be things like diabetes or heart disease, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, things like that, okay? And when we talk about diseases in terms of infections, infections are when we have colonization of a host by an organism. And when we talk about infectious diseases, of course, that's going to be when that infection leads to impairment of the structure and function of the body. Now, how do we gauge whether or not someone has a disease or an infection? We look at SS, signs and symptoms. Signs are objective and measurable. They can be observed by other people. So when you go to the doctor, they take your temperature, they take your heart rate, they take your blood pressure, they, you know, may look for a rash if you're vomiting. These are all things that can be seen by someone else. When we talk about symptoms, they are things that are subjective. They're felt by the patient. The patient can describe them, but they cannot be clinically measured or clinically observed. Pain is a symptom. Not that it's any less important than the signs than those things that can be observed by the care provider, healthcare provider, but the healthcare provider can't see pain. They can't see malaise or fatigue or nausea. So symptoms are things that are subjective. They can be important in the diagnosis if depending on you know where pain is felt or how long the nausea has been going on or how long the pain or fatigue have lasted. So they're not any less important. They just can't be clinically observed by the healthcare provider. Communicable and contagious. A communicable disease can be spread from person to person. A contagious disease is a communicable disease that is easily spread. Communicable does not always equal contagious. Just because a disease can be transmitted from person to person doesn't mean that that happens easily and, and it's not contagious. So I'll put a little note here. Sexually transmitted infections are communicable. They are spread from person to person, but they aren't contagious. They're not easily spread. You have to have sexual contact with someone in order to catch okay, or transmit a sexually transmitted infectious uh, infection. So when we talk about something being contagious, it's something that's easily spread. Something like the measles that spread by droplets, chicken pox spread by droplets. And we can measure the contagiousness of a disease by a specific measurement called the R not, and we'll talk about that as we get to the end of the semester when we talk about epidemiology. We'll talk about, you know, determining if a communicable disease is contagious or not by its R not factor. An iatrogenic infection occurs as a result of a medical procedure, so this can be in treating a wound, this can be inserting a catheter, it can be due to surgery. 
Um, zoonotic diseases, we'll talk a lot about these. These are transmitted from animals to humans. And animals, keep in mind, doesn't just mean, you know, a dog or a cat that you got bit or scratched by. Animals also include flies, ticks, and mosquitoes. Non-communicable is a disease that's not spread from one person to another, so it's acquired in a different type of manner. Something like tetanus, that is a non-communicable disease. If I contract tetanus from, you know, a wound, I can't spread that to you. Okay, so it's a non-communicable disease. Now, when we look at the periods of disease, they really kind of correspond to that growth curve that we saw with bacteria. And there's a really um, nice growth curve in your um, book. In 15.1, there is the growth curve. It's figure 15.3, and it shows um, kind of the number of pathogen particles versus the severity of the signs and symptoms. So we first have the incubation period. This is from the time that we are infected, but before the signs and symptoms begin. Then we have the prodromal period, which is the general signs and symptoms. That's when you kind of say like, oh, I think I'm coming down with something, or, um, you know what, I just don't feel very well. That's the prodromal period where you start to get some of those general signs and symptoms. Maybe you start running a little bit of fever. Maybe you have some fatigue or malaise. And then we get to the period of illness. This is when we have the characteristic signs and symptoms. So these are the obvious um, signs and symptoms where we have, you know, a rash, we have a cough, we have high fever, um, we have body aches, whatever the characteristic signs and symptoms are of that particular infection. And then we start to get into the period of decline. We get on antibiotics or our immune system starts kicking in and the number of pathogens starts to decline, which means that we start to feel better. The signs and symptoms are going away. And then we get to the convalescence phase where the patient will generally, you know, return to normal functions. Now, the person may not be 100%. You know, if you have some type of infection of the skin and, you know, you end up having to have a piece of, you know, skin or muscle removed, which can happen in cases like um, necrotizing fasciitis, if that occurs, then you may not go back to 100%, you know, as good as you were before the infection occurred. A couple of other definitions here, acute, chronic, and latent. Acute is a rapid onset of disease conditions, and most of the things that we're going to talk about in here are acute. The changes occur over a relatively short period of time. There's a rapid onset of disease um, conditions. Chronic is when those changes occur over a long period of time. You can be infected for months or years without even realizing you're infected until one day you start showing symptoms, something like hep B. And then we have latent diseases. In a latent disease, this is typically you have an acute phase, so you have the infection, you start to show signs and symptoms, then you recover and you think, oh, it's gone. But what's happening is that that particular pathogen, and this usually happens with viruses, that pathogen goes dormant. It's still there. You haven't gotten rid of it, but it's dormant. It's not actively replicating. And then something may trigger it to start to replicate, and then it becomes present again. You start to show signs and symptoms again. Herpes viruses are notorious for latency. Um, so things like HSV-1, herpes simplex virus type 1 and type 2 that causes cold sores um, type 1 and type 2 causes um, genital herpes. 
chicken pox, which we know can reactivate and become shingles. So the herpes viruses are notorious for remaining latent. Now, as we get into 15.2, we get into Koch's postulates. So Robert Koch, who we know was essentially the father of the microbiology laboratory, he invented a lot of the procedures that we still use today. Um, he came up with this idea of how to determine if a suspected pathogen is actually the cause of the disease. And so what he came up with is that the suspected pathogen has to be present in every individual, every organism that's sick and absent in those who are healthy. Then that pathogen, that suspected pathogen has to be isolated and we grow it in the lab. And then we take a healthy organism, we introduce it to the pathogen, it gets sick, and then we re-isolate that pathogen um, again. Now, back in Koch's time, this worked perfectly because he was able to find these microbes, grow them in the lab, and make healthy organisms sick. But now, when we look at some of the disease processes, some of the pathogens that we know about, we can't do this in every case. Um, something like HIV, we can't fulfill Koch's postulates for HIV because it, it's only in humans. So there are no test subjects. And I don't know anybody who's gonna stand in line to get injected with the human immunodeficiency virus. Um, syphilis. Treponema pallidum can't get it to grow in the lab, okay? Um, we can't get it to grow in culture in the lab. So we honestly can't fulfill Koch's postulates for every disease. We try, but we can't do it for every disease. One thing that we're going to talk a lot about when we get into our specific pathogens is pathogenicity and virulence. Pathogenicity is the ability of the microbe to cause disease, and virulence is how pathogenic are they, okay? The more factors that an organism has, that a microbe has to make it um, pathogenic, you know, the more virulent it becomes. And, and as you'll see, as you read through 15.3 um, and 15.4, um, we have a lot of different virulence factors. So a primary pathogen can cause disease regardless of the host normal flora, regardless of their immune status. An opportunistic pathogen takes advantage of the opportunity. It um, is going to cause disease when the host defenses are compromised. Either they're already sick, you know, their body's already fighting off something, they've taken antibiotics, um, their system is being taxed. Um, so that's an opportunistic pathogen. Something like, you know, candida yeast. Um, yeast infections are opportunistic infections. Um, as long as the flora, remain, normal flora of the vagina remains intact, the yeast can't get a foothold, they can't grow, they can't cause disease, okay? Portal of entry is how the microbe enters the host. Um, typically, this is through the mucous membranes, like the mouth or the nose or the vagina, the anus, um, or the parenteral route. As long as the skin remains intact, it is a really good barrier. But if we break that continuous barrier, then we can introduce organisms in. So needles, insect bites, you know, wounds of any kind, cuts and scrapes. Um, if we introduce bacteria or other microbes in, that is referred to as the parenteral route. Another portal of entry can be the placenta. There are some pathogens that can cross the placenta. We have this acronym called TORCH. And these are the big dogs in terms of crossing the placenta. So we have toxoplasmosis. O stands for others, which includes syphilis, HIV, hepatitis B, fifth disease, 
R is rubella, C is C and B, cytomegalovirus, and H include the herpes viruses, which are the herpes simplex virus and the herpes zoster, which is the chicken pox shingles. All of those are able to cross the placenta. Now, once the microbe has made its way in, it gets, gets into the, it goes through a portal to get in, then we have adhesion, which is its ability to attach to body surfaces. And we're going to have these chemicals or these um, molecules called adhesins that allow the cells or viruses to be able to attach to our cells. Invasion is once the uh, pathogen is disseminated throughout the local area or throughout the entire body, which can then become systemic. Local, confined to a small area near the portal of entry, so, you know, a cut, a scrape, something like that. A focal infection is when a local pathogen spreads to a second location. An example of this is with um, tooth decay, gingivitis. Um, we have a lot of different strep species that live in the mouth. And as long as they stay in the mouth, they're okay. But if they get into the bloodstream, they can go to the heart where they start to cause rheumatic fever or heart valve disease. Um, so that's an example of a focal infection. And then we can have a primary to secondary infection. This occurs when the initial pathogen um, you know, causes damage to the host, which then leads to an infection by a different pathogen. Um, so this is something like I talked about the other day with C. diff being, you know, an opportunistic pathogen. Um, a person gets sick, they have a primary infection, they get put on antibiotics. The antibiotics kill off their normal flora, and now C. diff can take over. Portal of exit how the microbe leaves the host. And, and most of the time, it leaves the same way it comes in, um, or at least the same membrane. So if something comes in through the mouth, it could leave through the mouth through vomiting or through the anus, through diarrhea. So it's still in that GI tract. If it's a sexually transmitted infection, you know, comes in through the vagina, can leave through the vagina through, you know, sexual contact. Um, so most of the time, the portal of entry and the portal of exit are the same, but they don't have to be. 